you have your Bibles, turn please to Matthew chapter 16. Praise the Lord. That's one of my favorite songs. I love it. And especially a cappella like that. Please keep preacher in your prayers and his family that they come back safely. Then be with Brother Corey. You may see him around here someplace today, but if you can hear him speak, he's going from a soprano to a bass real quick. His voice is pretty much shot. Matthew chapter 16, I'll begin reading with verse 13. Whoops, um, I'm at the wrong 16. I need to go. There we go. Beginning reading with verse 13. This morning we're looking at Jesus the rock. And when Jesus came unto the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say, Thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, Whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll take the words that are spoken this morning and use them for your honor and your glory. And Father, help me to say those things I ought to say and leave undone those things that ought to be left undone. I pray that you would take the message, Lord, and work in our hearts and use it for your honor and glory. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. As we look at the background of this passage a little bit, we see Jesus as he's speaking with Peter up at Caesarea Philippi, and he's asking uh, his disciples again, whom do, you say that, whom, whom do people say that I am? And Peter had been with Jesus a while, and he'd seen many miracles that he had done, and Jesus asked Peter two questions of himself. One, he says, who do men say that I am? There in verse 13. And Peter answers, some say that you're John the Baptist, some Elias or Elijah. Others, they say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then Jesus asked, but whom say ye that I am? And Peter answers and he says, well, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. This tremendous, great confession that here Peter is saying that he is understanding or saying that he is the Messiah. He is the God in the flesh. And Jesus then tells them that the reason Peter knows this is because God revealed it to him. We can't know anything unless God reveals it to us. And Jesus then says an amazing thing to Peter, which is often misunderstood because of a lack of understanding about the English translation of the Greek language. Jesus says to Peter, Thou art Peter. And the word there in the Greek is Petros. Thou art Petros, meaning a small rock. Actually, a piece of a rock. And then Jesus goes on to say, Upon this rock I will build my church. And in this case, he uses the word Petros, or Petra, which is, means a, a huge rock, a boulder, if you please. This is a mass of a rock. And this rock, as he says, this rock, he's pointing to himself, not to Peter. There's a religion that is among us today that teaches the people that this, that he is saying to Peter, thou art the rock, and Peter's not the rock. But Jesus is speaking of himself and only of himself. Jesus is the rock upon which we are to build. He implies, that the par he, he implies that at the parable of the wise and the foolish man. Turn back with me to Matthew chapter 7, and we'll just look at this briefly, and uh, beginning with verse uh, 24 through 27. We see the parable of the, of the, uh, rich, uh, the uh, wise man and the foolish man. In verse 24, Therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, 
which built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not is likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Again, going back to verse, the uh, verse where he says the man built his house upon the rock, it did not fall because it was founded upon a rock. The rock is the foundation. It's a sturdy place. Of course, our homes are built on concrete foundation, which is indeed a rock. The Bible has quite a bit to say about rocks and especially how they picture our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning I want to look at some of them for a few moments and see how they picture the Lord Jesus Christ and see who he is and what he is. First of all, well, let's pray as we continue on. Our Heavenly Father, be with us again, we ask. And teach us from your word today. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, first of all, we understand that Jesus is the rock of our salvation. In Psalm, 100, uh, Psalm 89 and verse 20, he shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. You know, kids like to sing that song, and I used to love to lead it in Bible school. Jesus is the rock of my salvation. His banner over me is love. Great song for kids to learn. Because he is our firm, solid, and endurable foundation. He cannot be moved. That rock cannot be moved. It's our foundation that speaks to us of eternal security. That once we have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, he has then become our foundation rock, and we'll never lose it. Amen. We'll have it forever. Everything about our faith rests upon the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that he is the rock, he as the rock, is the only foundation. He's the only way to be saved. John 14 and verse 6, Jesus says, saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And Peter was speaking to the Sanhedrin when they asked him after Jesus ascended into heaven. And he was taken and uh, put before the Sanhedrin and told that he couldn't preach in the name of Jesus anymore. And Peter was speaking to the Sanhedrin then when, he, when they asked him by what power he had healed the lame man as he went into the temple. And this is what Peter said, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Talk about a powerful, unfearful preacher to the Sanhedrin, the people that had put Jesus to death. This is, he says, even uh, by him doth this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there any salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved in Acts chapter 4 and verse 10. He is the salvation rock. He is a rock of our salvation. Then secondly, he's the rock of strength. Psalm 62 and verse 7 says, In God my, is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. He's pictured as a fortress of a rock. Now, the biggest picture I have of that in my mind is a castle. Did any of you see the royal wedding uh, on television yesterday? You saw Windsor Castle. It's a massive castle, stone structure. And, of course, it's the protection and so on. But he's pictured as that fortress. Psalm 31 and verse 3 says, For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me, guide me 
Now think of all those things he's saying, lead me and guide me. One of the songs I like to sing to myself in the morning during my devotions is, is the song that, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. Thou art mighty, but I am weak. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Lead me with your powerful hand. But anyway, and he goes on and says, Be thou my strong habitation in Psalm 71, verse 3, whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. You say, well, what is a fortress? Well, it's simply a place where a person lives. That's where they dwell. And of course, in the medieval days and other days, the fortress is there to provide the protection and so on. But it's a place where a person lives. And I can't help but think of Acts 17 and verse 28 that says, For in him we live and move and have our being. For in Him we live and move and have our being. Our life submerged in Him. As John 15 and verse 5 says, I am the vine and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. And this speaks of being within the Lord Jesus Christ, within that fortress. A fortress is a wall of rocks that surrounds those who live in it. Not only does he live in, do we live inside that fortress, as it were, but he also surrounds us. Our Lord Jesus Christ surrounds those who dwell in him. Aren't you glad? I say praise the Lord that in him we live and move, and he surrounds us he, with this fortress, with this protection, with his guidance. Praise the Lord. So he's not only the rock of our salvation, he's also the rock of strength. He is also the rock of refuge. It's very much like the rock of, of strength, but he's the rock of refuge. In Psalm 94 and verse 22, we read, but the Lord is my defense and my God is the rock of my refuge. Again, he is the rock of my refuge. In Psalm 62 also, as I quoted before, verse 7, the God of my, is my, in God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. You think about that. Imagine, again, a fortress, the imagery of a fortress again. It provides protection from Satan's darts and from his arrows. In Psalm 31 and verse 2, we read, Bed, bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily, but thou art my strong rock for a house of defense to save me. He provides a place to hide, to feel secure amidst the battle. Have you ever been in the midst of the battle and you got alone with the Lord and you picked up your Bible and you spent some time in the Word of God and you found that strength, you found that refuge that he's speaking about here. Such a sweet and blessed time it is. As we go through times of difficulty and trouble and heartache and things are not going well, to get alone with God and open the word of God and just say, Lord, I need to be in your refuge today. I need you to take my hand and to hold me and to guide me and to comfort me and to strengthen me. And only his word can do that. Provides a protection, protection from his darts. He provides a place to hide and feel secure amidst the battle. And this is worked out practically, you might say. Clearly, it's worked out, I think, in, through four things. The first one is reading and studying his word. As we read and study his word, that refuge is there. Obedience to his word. As we obey the word, it's not just that we read it, just that we maybe even hide it in our heart, but we take the Bible and we apply the truth that we learned that day, and we apply it and use it, and therefore he becomes our refuge in claiming his promises. Think back this week and see if there's any times in your life where you claimed his promises. They're there. And know ye of little faith, I say to myself often, and I have to constantly remind myself of the wonderful things that God has done 
One of the prayer requests I have in my prayer time in the morning is, Lord, increase my faith through thy word and through answered prayer to see how God answers prayer and what a blessing that is to find that strength. Claiming his promises. Mrs. Sparks, I can't tell you how many times I claimed his promises for Zach. And God came through, as he always does. And there are folks in here that I've claimed his promises for their health and for other things. And God always comes through. What a blessed pleasure that is. What a joy it is to claim his promises. And then, not only reading the word and studying his word, obedience to his word, claiming his promises, but least, last but not least is praying. We need to be praying. And we'll find refuge in him. Has there been times when you've just got alone with the Lord and just say, Lord, I need you. I need you. I need to feel your comfort. I need to feel your strength. I need to feel you working in my life. There are many times down through my life I've done that. And God always has been a refuge for me in a time like that. So he is the, he is the rock of refuge. He's the rock of salvation. He's the rock of, of uh, uh, wherever I am in my notes. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Terrible to get old. Brother George, you said, you said 50? Wait a minute. Wait till you get 70. Okay, he's the rock of my strength. He's the rock of my refuge. And then also, he is the rock in the wilderness. And in this rock in the wilderness pictures is a type of Christ, the rock of refreshment, nourishment. At the beginning of their trek in the wilderness, the children of Israel had come to a place where there was no water. And uh, they were at Horeb, and Moses there, God instructed Moses to strike the rock, and water came gushing out. And they had sweet water. They had all the water that they needed. God had provided the nourishment for them there in the wilderness. And the other time was at the end of their journey when Moses was told to speak to the rock and he struck the rock and water came out again. I had the privilege of being able to preach at that place. In, uh, it's right, by, uh, right at the south end of Israel, actually in Jordan, and be able to, to see that rock and to see where to this day the water is still coming out. Again, when Moses smote the rock, the water came out. And again, this pictures to me that the water, of course, had quenched their thirst, had taken care of them. And Jesus is the rock out of which flows the most refreshing and thirst-quenching spiritual water. He told the woman at the well at Sychar, if she would drink of his water, she would never thirst again. In John 6 and verse 35, he says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. He's the water of life that gives that spiritual life, that strength, and that nourishment that we need. In John 7, verses 37 and 38, we read, In the last days, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, If any man thirst, let him come after me and drink. How wonderful it is to be able to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and to drink of the waters of life. Do you know him as your Savior? Is he real to you? When you go and get alone with him and open the word of God, is it like a refreshing drink and a refreshing nourishment from the bread of life? as well as from the water of life. It ought to be. If you get alone with the Lord and you read your Bible and you say, well, I'm nothing out of it, I just read. If you're reading it just to read it, there's not going to be a whole lot that's going to mean anything to you. But you get alone and you ask him to read. Not that every single time you're going to come away with something that you say, okay, I got a hold of that. But for the most part, you will. And you know, not only that, have that sweet experience of having been with him. As you spend time reading the word of God, hiding it in your heart, meditating upon it, thinking about it, and then that sweet time in prayer when you share with him your needs and your burdens and your blessings and your praises. 
He is the rock in the wilderness that pictures refreshment and nourishment. And then I can think of him as a rock of sweetness. In Psalm 81, the psalmist, and in this case it's Asaph, who is telling what God would have done for the Israelites if they'd hearkened unto him. In verse 16, he says, He should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat and of the honey out of the rock, should I have, been, should I have satisfied thee. He brings sweetness of forgiveness of sins to those who accept him. That sweetness is wonderful. He brings the sweetness of his love to those who allow him to live and to love through them. When we love other people, it's not us loving them. It's God loving through us. It's God forgiving others. You say, I have a person that I just have a hard time forgiving. I had one like that one time. I just had a hard time forgiving her. She used to go behind the preacher's back and say all kinds of things and used to get things going that weren't good. And I built up a little resentment about that until finally one day the Lord convicted me. As she, it's not going to change until you get your heart right with me about your attitude towards her. And it wasn't my strength, I can tell you this, but his strength that allowed me to go and to confess what my heart was feeling and how wrong it was and ask forgiveness. By the way, I never had a problem after that. But it was sweet. If not to her, it was to me. Because doing what God wanted me to do and knowing that I could not on my own. There may be somebody that you resent, that you say, I can never forgive. Well, then you get on your knees and you say, Lord, give me the ability to forgive. Lord, you help me. You change my heart. You change my attitude. And you do the work through me. As we said, the, the branch is grafted into the vine. And he says, without me, John 15, ye can do nothing. Anything that I would ever accomplish for the Lord Jesus Christ in life, being like I should be for my wife, being like I should be for my family, being like I should be to other people, I cannot do it without him doing it through me. And by the way, when that happens, what a tremendous blessing it is. And what a sweetness it really is. We see the rock of that sweetness. He brings sweetness to all those in love through him. Again, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. If ye know me, in 1 John 3 and verse 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. You know what the mark of a Christian is? It's not that he obeys all the commandments. It's not that he lives that straight and narrow way, as it were. You know what it was in Bible days? God's people had love for others. It was the love of God shining through other people that drew people to them. I used to think that the best way to get somebody saved is preach hell to them. But do you know more people respond to the love of Christ than they do even the, the hell of judgment? But nevertheless, he's there wanting to live through you and love others through you and help you forgive others, give you that strength and that, that power to be able to do that. He brings sweet peace to all those who hearken to his words. In Proverbs 3 and verse 25, we read, When thou layest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down and sleep. Thy sleep shall be sweet. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, we read, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he is the God that brings, we can see him as the rock of sweetness. As we grow in grace, we develop, I believe we develop his sweet spirit. Why? Because as Christians, we are to become like him. 
One of the requests I asked the Lord in the morning is, Lord, uh, let this mind be in me, which was also in Christ Jesus. At the end of the day, I look back and say, did I make it? No, but I still pray it because I want my mind to be what his mind is, that I'm thinking about other people and their needs and that I'm thinking about the eternal values instead of just uh, physical or material values and that I'm thinking with the kind of love and compassion that I should have. Do I succeed every day? No, but I still ask. And he does give us that sweetness as we grow more and more like him. His spirit of love and concern he gives to us in compassion. He gives that spirit of forgiveness. He gives that heartache and burden for lost souls. It's one of the things that I'm burdened about a lot, and you think this would be strange for a preacher, but that God would really, really burden my heart to be concerned about lost souls. We go by people, we see people, we read about things, and we hear about things, and then we just go on as if life goes on, and we very seldom think about the needs of the people and those that are lost and those that are without Christ and how they need them. And Lord, how you can use me to help me. One of my prayer requests every day, and I haven't achieved it yet either, is, that, is the Lord help me love others and have compassion for their souls and be my witnessing would not be something that I've forced, but that would be a lifestyle. How many of you know Brother John Monk? Keep praying for him. That guy's unbelievable, and I'm not lifting him up as a god or anything else. But Brother Lindsay and I, we went to visit him at different times this last week in the hospital. And that character won't give anybody two or three minutes before he's witnessing to them. I sat there and listened preach to a nurse practitioner, and she was just uh, 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 listening. And... Uh, the guy in the bed next to him, I had gone to see him that morning, and, the guy, and he talked to him until 2 in the morning. They both sat th laid there and talked, and he said, he's a brother in the Lord. He knows he's saved. We go over to Taco Bell to eat sometimes on Sunday after church, and he's always ready to give the young lady there a counter a track. It's a way of life for him. And I, I'm around him for a little while, and I get convicted, thinking, Lord, why? I, you know, he's always, you know, I need to be that way. But you know, as we grow more and more Christ-like, he gives us more of the strength and the power to do that. He gives us a heartache and a burden for lost souls. And then there's one last rock that Jesus could be likened unto. And this is kind of a hard one, but it's true. The rock of judgment. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, we read, And it's appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. He is the Savior now, but he will be the judge at the great white throne judgment for those who don't trust in him now while they're on this earth. If you're here this morning without the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I appeal to you and, and ask that you would trust him as your Savior. For it is a day, and we don't know when it is. We have no guarantee on the next moment of our life. Saved or unsaved, and for unsaved, even more treacherous, that because then that time comes, there's no chance after that to trust Christ. And the Bible says that we will stand, that they will stand, folks without Christ will stand at the great white throne judgment. And I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it, and those whose face, and uh, those whose face the heaven and earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book according to their works. And that doesn't mean that you stand before God and he looks at your works. And if your good works outweigh your bad works, then you're going to go to heaven. That's not what those works are. Those works are the things that you're going to be, the judgment, degree of judgment, of punishment you're going to have in the lake of fire. It's not whether you go to heaven on those works or not. That's already determined by whether you accepted Christ as your Savior. Amen. But those works will be determined how, what we say sometimes, how hot the hell is. 
And the, and the, the slightest little bit of hell is worse than anything we could even begin to imagine. And he goes and says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell were delivered. That's the body and the soul were delivered up, uh, delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, again, for the degree of punishment. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. I have a brother and his wife that have seven children. They're all grown. They're all Mormon. And if I understand the Bible correctly and, and their doctrine correctly, they believe that they're going to get to heaven on their good works. But that's not what the Bible says. And every morning when I pray for them, my heart is broken. And I say, I can see my brother's face in my, in my, fa his, uh, in my face. And I say, Lord, I don't want them to spend an eternity in the lake of fire. Jenny's, some of Jenny's family the same way. I don't want to see them spend eternity in the lake of fire. Lord, work in their heart. Lord, somehow send your Holy Spirit. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Amen. Let me tell you, if Wendy can get saved, anybody can get saved, right, Andy? Amen. Amen. And the same with Brother Paul, who's here. If Jesus is not the rock of our salvation then he's the rock of our judgment. Rather him be the rock of our salvation. He will be the rock of judgment for believers at the judgment seat of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, we read, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in the body. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And this is, again, not a judgment of whether you go to heaven or not. This is a judgment of rewards that God will give to you. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day he shall declare it. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved, yet as by fire. We'll be there, and we'll watch our brothers and sisters, and we'll see some receive a reward. And I have a feeling we'll see the reward we would have gotten, but we didn't because we didn't take advantage of the opportunity that God gave us. And the sorrow for believers there will be in the loss of the reward. It's like giving two kids, brother and sister there, and you give them both... You give one of them a piece of candy and you don't give the other one one. How sad. And the other one, that you don't get a piece of candy because you didn't, know, you didn't do this or you didn't do that. And how bad they're going to feel. Well, consider what it would be like standing before an almighty God and realizing we didn't take advantage of opportunities he gave us and he brings that before us. Yes. There's so much there. Jesus is the rock. He's the rock of your salvation. And if he is the rock of your salvation, he may also be the rock of your strength, the rock of your refuge, the rock of your refreshment, the rock of sweetness. However, I'm, as I mentioned before, if he's the rock of your salvation, he'll be the rock of judgment to eternal torment in the lake of fire. You can change that by accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted him, a time in your life when you've called upon the Lord and you said, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe he rose again the third day. And I believe he wants to save me. And Lord, I'm calling on you to save me. The Bible says that when you do that, you shall be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes, preacher, I know that, but I'm just going to wait for a more convenient time. The convenient time never comes. Today is the day of salvation. Why not accept him and trust him and let, let him be the rock of these various things that I mentioned today in your life? And what a joy and a blessing it would be. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your blessings, Lord. We're thankful for the fact that you indeed are the rock of our salvation, 
the rock of strength, the rock of nourishment, and all the various things that we mentioned this morning. But Lord, also realize that you're the rock of judgment. And may we walk with you as we should. If we're not saved, if we've not trusted Christ, if there's anyone who hasn't trusted Christ, that today would be the day of their salvation. Don't let them hold back. Don't let them say, I don't want to go forward and, and let people think that I'm not saved or whatever. Lord, let us do business with you today and see the blessings that you have for us. For it is in your name we pray. Shall we stand as we...